Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our Lunch and Learn event entitled Fine Art Exhibitions in 19th Century English-Speaking Montreal, an International Perspective. I'm Lorraine O'Donnell, Senior Research Associate and Advisor at the Quebec English-Speaking Communities Research Network. I'm also an Affiliate Professor at Concordia University. Before continuing, I'd like to acknowledge that while we meet today on the virtual platform, Concordia University is located on unceded Indigenous lands. The Ghanaian Gahaha Nation is recognized as the custodian of these lands and waters. Chojoge, or Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. And today it's home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We continue, including at Questgren, we are trying to be um, effective and thoughtful in reflecting on the ways in which we can work in collaboration with Indigenous communities to form mutual and ongoing relationships. Today's event is made possible through the financial support of the Department of Canadian Heritage. Questgren also receives funding from the Secretariat aux Relations avec les Québécois d'Expression Anglaise, the Canadian Institute for Research on Linguistic Minorities, and Concordia University. And please note this is a space for intellectual exchange. Any views or opinions expressed in this talk do not necessarily represent those of Questgren or its funders. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Aaron Hurley. Aaron is Professor of English at McGill University. Aaron. Thanks, Lorraine. Hello, everyone. Very nice to see um, so many people come to hear Dr. Lauren Houston, um, who I'm going to give you a brief bio, who is a retired teacher, as many of you know, from the Cégep Édouard Montpetit, where he taught history and sociology. He's also, of course, a researcher member of Questgren and is affiliated with the CRILC, or the Centre de Recherche Interuniversitaire sur la Littérature et la Culture du Québec. Um, his publications, which are many, are focused on the history of the art sector in English Montreal during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I uh, first got to know Lauren's research through his publications and presentations on early 20th century Montreal Anglophone Theatre, in fact. So there's a paper on Martha Allen and one on the early uh, Canadian scene uh, in Montreal. And also through his very detailed um, historical analysis and reconstruction of how early French language theatre in Montreal was received in the pages of the Montreal Star, for example. Um, his most recent book uh, is George M. Brewer et le milieu culturel anglophone montréalais, um, 1900 to 1950. 1950, sorry, 1950. So uh, today, as you know, the talk is called Fine Art Exhibitions in 19th Century English Speaking Montreal, an International Perspective. Um, and uh, perhaps after Lauren speaks, I'm, I will ask him how this work is connected to previous work um, that I know of his on the 1913 Spring Exhibition of the Art Association of Montreal. But for now, um, let's uh, open our ears and minds to hearing what Dr. Houston has to tell us about the fine art scene in Montreal in the early 20th century. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Aaron, and, uh, and thanks too to the organizers of this event. Uh, Anna Hunt in particular was very helpful uh, through the process and I, I really appreciate the chance to be able to share my ideas and and my questions and, and doubts and ideas and so on uh, for this period. Uh, I, this, is a, this is a new period for me at uh, the late 19th century and so it's a work in progress but I'll be very interested in hearing your comments and your uh, questions. Uh, it, it, it can be very useful. So just to, to mention what I can say is that the 19th century Montreal Anglophones do not have a particularly poor reputation for their um, cultural uh, uh, matter, including cultural matters and so on. Uh, but there was a concentrated effort starting in the 1860s 
to organize annual art exhibitions. This was through the Art Association of Montreal. And I wanted to look at them and compare them to similar cultural manifestations in other cities at the same time. I felt intuitively that it would, be, uh, it would not be useful to compare the situation in Montreal with the principal art centers of Europe uh, and America, like the annual Salon in Paris or the exhibition of the Royal Academy in London. Uh, so I chose three other cities as points of comparison, Liverpool, Boston, and Toronto. Uh, Liverpool and Boston were regional capitals and port cities like Montreal. Furthermore, some members of the council at the Art Association of Montreal were well aware of the art uh, situation in these cities. Uh, there were two, there was one fellow, uh, Thomas Rimmer, that was from Liverpool and that was well connected to the art scene in Liverpool. And another fellow, uh, um, Frothingham, George Henry Frothingham, that was from New England and his wife was from Boston. And uh, they were very, uh, there, there was some of the family that was in Boston and so on. So they were very well connected uh, to that area. So these are, they were certainly aware of the situation in these other cities at the same time. And of course, this goes for, uh, without saying practically for the situation in Toronto. So we, when we read the minutes and the so on of the, the docu administrative documents of the Art Association, we do see references to uh, Liverpool and Boston. So basically, the way, the way I want to make this presentation work, I'll just uh, give you some basic information that I needed to begin, even to begin the research, was when did these art exhibitions start on a regular basis? Where did Montreal fit into that? How were they run? What I call the management models, uh, compare the management models for the different cities. And then a point came as trying to sum up everything that I learned from this process uh, was the question of supply. If you're having annual art exhibitions, you need new paintings every year, or pretty well uh, every year. And, uh, and this was a real problem in Montreal. And I think that it helps us understand uh, something of the situation. So the initial points of comparison, management models, and the issue of super, uh, uh, supply. So just to look at it quickly in terms of chronology, uh, just the annual art exhibitions were a really important factor in changing the art world. When you have annual art exhibitions, you have a, actors coming together in new ways. Uh, organizers of the exhibitions, renders to the exhibitions, artists, and so on. And so this phenomenon really was a 19th century phenomenon across Western Europe and, and America. And of course, in France, it had started in much earlier in the 17th century. Uh, in London, it had started in the 18th century. But as we see in the 19th century, uh, we see the American Academy of the Fine Arts, uh, which ceased to exist in 1841. Pennsylvania was also a very important part at the very beginning. And then Liverpool comes in in about 1810. The National Academy of Design, which was maybe the more important uh, uh, exhibition society in New York, is, comes in 1825. And then there's a whole slew of organizations that come in in the mid-20s. Uh, Manchester, the Royal Scottish Academy, and Edinburgh and Boston really starts in about 1820. And then uh, we see the fine arts section of the Upper Canada Provincial Exhibition, which uh, I will talk about. It's something of a uh, surprise there that uh, it's a really an exception and an interesting one. Montreal comes along, Buffalo, uh, the Ontario Society of Artists, Baltimore. I should say there should a word of caution. These dates shouldn't be seen as like black and white uh, facts. The history of regular art exhibitions is very much a start and stop process. This is true in Montreal and it is true elsewhere. In almost all cities, an initiative would be launched, which would last for a few years, and then activities would be suspended. The dates indicated here should be seen as an indication of the years when art exhibitions began on a more regular basis. So sometimes there, there would be a few exhibitions before these dates, and then it would fall aside. So I, I, these were judgment calls, but it gives a, a general idea. Uh, let's look now at the 
the question of demography, because that's a very, the demographics of the situation, it's a very important factor. Uh, we see Liverpool is far and away a, a much bigger city than, uh, here. this is Boston here. The red is Montreal, and uh, the blue is Toronto. And this uh, kind of pink uh, one is, is English Montreal. And so what you can see, actually it, here the scale doesn't really allow us to, to distinguish the difference between English Montreal and Toronto in the early period. But uh, at, in the early period, uh, Toronto was only about two thirds of the uh, population of English Montreal. Uh, by 1860, it was almost equal. There were just about as many people in English Montreal as, as there were just about as many people in Toronto as there were in English Montreal. And uh, by 1870, that had switched over and there were more people in Toronto than in English Montreal. And I'll, I'll discuss a little bit, you, as you can imagine, why I'm making this distinction between English Montreal and, and Montreal as a whole. So we see here that the English Montreal population grows levels off, as in fact, there are a lot of uh, English Montrealers that are leaving in that time, going to Ontario, going to the Midwest, especially Irish Protestants. And uh, and in, there are a lot of French Canadians leaving uh, at that time as well, going to New England, also going to uh, the Midwest American. But a lot of them are also moving into Montreal. And so that's why we see that there, there's, there's a real rapid growth in Montreal at that time but it's mainly French Canadians who've moved into the suburbs. And now just a few words about the size. It's not, uh, we'll, you see here that there's this Liverpool Society, which has pretty huge exhibitions, 900 works, 1,000 works, 1,250 works, and so on, of art that are being shown. On the whole, there's not a huge uh, difference in the size of the exhibition that, we're looking at, that we'll be looking at today. The Liverpool, the Liverpool Society I'll be, is run by art patrons and works as practically a kind of a municipal society, uh, whereas the Liverpool Academy is run by artists. The uh, Boston, uh, Montreal, Boston is really usually run by art patrons as well. It's an Athenaeum. Athenaeum. Uh, Montreal is run by art patrons. And then we've got these provincial exhibitions in Ontario that uh, move around from year to year. And uh, so, for example, in Coburg in 1855, Toronto in 1862, Kingston in 1867. It really won't be until about 1872 that there will be regular annual art exhibitions in Toronto. So I'd like to look at that. I've, I've referred to it briefly as in the early parts, the uh, artistic institution and uh, managed model. So basically, we can we can say there are two kind of types of, of organization. Ones that are artist led, usually kind of on an academic model. There's a, a group of artists that allows uh, invites other people to join it and and so on, co-opting. And they organize the exhibitions. They can have sometimes they'll have uh, certainly on many times they'll have help, and sometimes they'll have uh, trust uh, sponsors and so on. But all of the decisions are uh, made by the artist. And uh, the other model, of course, is the art patron model. And um, the artist-led institutions tended to function somewhat in the same way as an academy, controlling entrance qualifications, emphasizing career development, sales and uh, medals and so on that would be uh, uh, promoted at the, at the exhibition. That patron-led institution tended to function somewhat in the same way as the museum. The emphasis was more on education, and it included art from other periods and countries. Often these institutions drew upon works from private collections. These were called loan exhibitions, and the lenders were recognized in some cases, almost on par with the contribution of the artist. Uh, there was thus a potential for conflict of interest between contemporary artists and art patrons when the exhibition was not particularly focused on contemporary art by regional or national artists. In other cases, the role of the patron was to support a civic institution which would bring prestige to the city. 
So Liverpool, there was almost always both types of artistic institutions uh, active. A Liverpool Academy and a patron-led organization. They, the patron-led organizations didn't tend to last for a very, very long period. They would last for maybe five or six years. They would drop away, come back again with different people and so on. And, uh, and, the, and the, But the Liverpool Academy did run pretty well all through the 19th century. It stopped, actually, it, it stopped in the 1860s. Um, sometimes these two types of organizations were rivals. Sometimes they worked together. In the 1860s, the Liverpool Academy was smaller than the Liverpool, uh, Liverpool Society for the Fine Arts. In Boston, it was a patron-led society dominated, which dominated the art scene for the better part of the 19th century. And the annual art exhibitions were organized by the Boston Athenaeum, which was basically a library and a cultural center. But they, they did uh, organize extremely well-prepared uh, art, art exhibitions on an annual uh, basis as well. Each year, the Athenaeum brought, uh, bought work and constituted a private collection, which was eventually donated to the Boston Museum of Fine Art. The Athenaeum exhibition drew upon private collections in Boston and uh, 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 in Boston and contributions by local artists. But it soon became apparent that if these exhibitions were to be held annually, they would have to draw upon works from elsewhere. The Boston example shows how well connected a group of art patrons were to other collectors and art dealers elsewhere in the country. Exhibitions would often include features, uh, it would often in, uh, feature the collection of a particular individual. Sometimes these came from a collector located in Boston or in the Boston area, but by no means always. In Montreal, the Art Association was a patron-led society. There were no artists on council. Uh, the early exhibitions were loan exhibitions, but dealers and artists were also submitted works of art, and some were for sale. But whether they were for sale or not, these exhibitions did contribute to making local artists known and appreciated by the Montreal public. An attempt was made to set up an artist society, artist-led society, in 1867, which lasted for five years, but ran into, uh, had, had much difficulty. In Toronto, was, was really, uh, or in Ontario in general, it, it was an, an, an exception. And this has never really been studied. Uh, there's, there's very little work that is academic work that's been done on the history of art exhibitions, uh, except for uh, one very interesting piece by Harper, on the Upper Canada Provincial Exhibition uh, that I will be referring to here. And uh, I've been able to con consult, consult some uh, of the uh, prize lists that were awarded or that were announced for these exhibitions, but I haven't been able to find catalogs. And I now I've been able to find catalogs for the Ontario Society of Artists, but I was only able to find them recently. And they're in the Ontario Provincial Archives and I haven't had a chance to, to check them yet. Um the uh the the these the, the art, ex art exhibition society in Toronto grew out of the agricultural and industrial fairs organized by the provincial government. Uh they began in 1848, and no other example of this as there's no other example of this that I can find where the art exhibition society that gradually emerged came from these industrial, agricultural industrial affairs. And, and in fact, it was run by the Department of Agriculture in Upper Canada and in Ontario in the early period. And in general, these were very, uh, not very prestigious uh, venues for, for the uh, fine arts. And many uh, artists didn't even bother to, to, to submit their works to them. But there, there, were, there were artists that did uh, go through that. And, they, there were prizes that were awarded and cash prizes, which was very important for, for artists at that time, and uh, um, uh, certificates and so on, that some of these artists, especially those interested in, would also be doing photography or portraits and so on, would uh, uh, very much appreciate these, these prizes. Um, 
when the Ontario Society of Artists was created in 1872, there we do see also that the provincial government supported the Ontario Society. Uh, um, they, uh, they gave prizes as well. They constituted, um, uh, they bought works of art for a, for a thousand dollars per year at the, yeah. uh, uh, for the provincial collection of painting. And, um, they helped to finance a school of art, uh, that, uh, and it was members of the Ontario Society of Artists that were hired as teachers for the, the, in the school of art. Uh, I should say too that there was the collection of, uh, paintings that were bought by the Ontario government. These were housed in the, uh, normal school, the educational faculty under Ryerson, as a matter of fact. And so there was a, a way that these art pieces of uh, works of art that were bought could be seen and could be used for teaching and so on. Okay, now I'd like to uh, uh, I'll just go to the issue of supply very quickly. Uh, the institution institutionalization of regular art exhibitions was an important development in the art world because it brought together actors, uh, that is artists, lenders, buyers of art, and so on. And as I read over the exhibition catalogs and administrative documents, it struck me that there was another dimension that regular art exhibitions brought to the situation, and that was the necessity of constant renewal. If the same artworks were on view year after year, it could no longer be considered as an annual art exhibition. It would be a museum. In Montreal in particular, this was a problem. It was a smaller city than most of the other art centers, and there were other elements of the context which made it difficult to gain access to a regular flow of contemporary work. First of all, there's the factor of uh, imp the imperial context, where the uh, the art exhibitions of uh, Montreal were very much a product of the English Montreal community. The attachment to the empire, the closely connected to the, the they tended to be closely connected to the Protestant clergy. The president of the art association was the Anglican um, bishop, and a number of people on council at different times were members of the Protestant clergy because they had uh, a classical education, they were interested in art uh, uh, as well. And But these were not things that would help in particular uh, cross the cultural gap uh, with a French, a French speaking Montreal. And uh, there, I'm not saying that there was a, a high degree of uh, hostility, but there was this recognition that this was for Anglophone. Uh, and there was also, we see part of the situation too, there was absolutely no question that the uh, Art Association would work with pr provincial institutions or municipal institutions in the same way that they were doing in uh, Toronto. I think that they felt that their autonomy would be threatened uh, in that, that context. Even more important, so it basically we're working with English Montreal, which is a lot less, uh, which is a lot less, uh, a lot less people than Montreal as a whole. Um, another factor which was also very important was the absence of exhibition networks. Crucial to the success of the Liverpool and Boston institutions was the fact that they were part of a network of cities that could provide a regular supply of contemporary artwork. This was an essential ingredient for the success of the Liverpool institution. The public was first and foremost interested in seeing the work of well-known British artists. In fact, the, liberal, the Liverpool authorities had to offer to pay the transportation costs for the works of the most famous London artists. Without this incentive, these artists would simply not submit their works to the exhibition, and without these, these paintings, public attendance dropped off sharply. If the work was sold, the exhibition society reimbursed itself from the sales price for the transportation cost it had paid, as well as charging a 5% commission. It does not appear that there was any such arrangement in Boston about paying uh, transportation costs, but there is little doubt that the opportunity to view works by successful artists from New York and Philadelphia contributed to the success of the Boston uh, exhibition. Montreal was not part of any such network. In 1865, the Art Association, Art Association did try to come to some kind of 
working arrangement with American art dealers, but it does not seem to be have been a success since the experience was not repeated. Montreal patron, art patrons loaned works of British and European artists, which they owned, and some Montreal artists felt that these works tended to overshadow works by local artists, but there, there was no simple solution to the problem. Interestingly enough, this situation changed as time goes on. By the end of the century, the spring exhibitions, composed mainly of the works by contemporary Canadian artists, uh, attracted more visitors than the loan exhibitions, composed of paintings drawn from the private collections in Montreal. Final point, uh, the, the Boston and, and Liverpool were able to use a number of self-financing activities through lotteries uh, that they would put works of art that would be up sale and so on, uh, through commissions of, on sales, through membership fees, ticket sales for the exhibitions and so on. But because of the low, the, the, the difficult demographic situation, these solutions were much less uh, profitable in Montreal. So that's basically what I wanted to mention and to say that when we try to evaluate the dynamism of the art sector in Montreal, it is important to consider the de demographics of the situation. One might think that the dominant economic position of an elite obviates the need for economic viability and popular success of fine art exhibitions. But there's no doubt that the development of the fine arts in Montreal was uh, part, of a, part of a process of, a, of, of affirmation of the symb symbolic power of an economic elite. This was true in Montreal as it was true elsewhere. But the social significance of this phenomenon was not simply a matter of interest to that small and relatively newly established elite in Montreal. Art exhibitions were also struggles for recognition by other sectors of Montreal society, by French Canadians, by women, by new generations of Montrealers. And without these struggles for recognition and the attempt to accommodate them, the art association exhibitions would not have become viable. Even the arts of the elite in the industrial age need to resonate with a significant part of the population. If, it, if attendance is lacking at art exhibitions, it will be difficult to convince artists to send their work. Art patrons won't lend them, dealers won't promote them, and critics to talk about. Critics won't really have anything to talk about. I would argue that the six art exhibitions held in Montreal between 1864 and 1872 reveal a community which is at least as dynamic as other cities with similar demographics. But there is no doubt that the struggle to build solid art institutions during this period was a challenge. It was a challenge which was met with a considerable degree of success by the Art Association at the turn of the 20th century and for a good many years afterwards. I hope that this study of the institutionalization of the art sector in Montreal in its early years can help us appreciate the process through which the, the vi viable visual art sector emerged in English Montreal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lauren. That was really interesting. And um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, okay, so we'll start with uh, Peter Roberts. Hi, Peter. Um, Peter says, in the three or four cities that you're comparing, can you say approximately how long the works were on display, days, weeks, months, and in what kind of physical space? Very, uh, very interesting question. So I have to think uh, off the top of my head. Uh, but um, in Montreal, they were very short exhibitions. Like lots of times it was only a week or something like that. Uh, there were other times when they tried all kinds of things in Montreal, really, and there were times where it was longer. Um, in Boston, it could be a month. And uh, Liverpool, I think that in general, there were uh, uh, exhibitions that would last a month. Uh, in um, the the uh, exhibitions, uh, the Upper Canada exhibitions and so on, the Ontario Society, I'm not sure. I really just like, I, but it's a, a very interesting question. In Boston, the uh, Athenium did uh, have an, uh, built an exhibition uh, venue uh, for the art. And uh, it was, it was not, a, it was, um, it was close to the, it was in the same building as the, uh, the library or right on the same property and so on. Uh, Liverpool had uh, ex exhibition halls at different times. 
uh, it did, but it also tended to move around. There was there was a fair degree of uh, instability there. That's about as good as I can do off the top of my head. But a very interesting question. I, I'll I'll make a note of keeping that in mind. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to see how that correlates or doesn't with the demographics that you were talking about and the kind of institutional structures that existed or didn't exist, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think, but it's true that I'm pretty sure that the Montreal exhibitions were shorter than the other, than the other one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, another participant asks, can you tell us something about the artists and artworks that were popular in Montreal in that early period uh, um, during your study of your study? Yeah. Uh, so there were, uh, there were, the art community in Montreal itself was pretty small. Uh, mm -hmm. I said there were two artists that lived in Montreal for that whole period. There were artists that were coming in to Montreal from the United States, from Europe, would stay for a couple of years, try and get contracts and everything like that, and then would move on to another uh, city. One of the uh, uh, people may have uh, attended the exhibition that's at the McCord Museum right now uh, with uh, James Duncan, and J Duncan was certainly uh, present during this time. And uh, uh, but he was he was an older generation. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the younger the younger artists uh, there was Jacoby. There's these are not names that are very well. Well, there's Alan Edson that was uh, from the Eastern Townships, and there was another. Um, uh, there were a couple of other uh, artists I can't remember the names of, but there weren't very many. What we call most of these paintings today have been forgotten. Hmm. And were these artists, so when you say there were only about 10 artists during that period, and so the period here is 1864 to 1872, the period of the exhibitions? Yes, yes. Now, I should say there were a lot more than 10 artists that were showing, uh, the contemporary artists, there was about maybe 70 or 80, but okay. a lot of these were just uh, coming through or right. they, were spending, they were spending their works and so on, um, so we don't know a lot about them. Okay, and of the local ones, can you give us a sense of their what they were like? What they were women, they were men, they were okay, well, townships, they were Montrealers, they were amateurs or professionals. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sorry. You know, I did do this all this uh, comparison, and you know, what percentage was contemporary art? What percentage was right. European art and everything like that? But uh, I focus on this. You know, Supply now, and I can't remember all the. Uh, there, there were there was about ten percent of women artists. Okay. Uh, and that was, and actually, you know, that was a pretty constant factor in all exhibitions, even in Liverpool as well, and in, in Boston and so on. Um, in terms of uh, in Montreal, they um, at the beginning of the period, there were the paintings tended to be more from private collections, loans of the art patrons, and maybe only about 20% uh, were uh, paintings by contemporary artists. And that evolved over the period. And there were, I would say by the end, there were more contemporary paintings, partly because, you know, the, the uh, paintings in the collections of the art collectors in Montreal had already been seen. And, and they had tried to show them some of them again in, in other contexts and so on. But People really reacted to that and said, you know, we don't want these old, these paintings that we've already seen and so on. And uh, so so gradually there was more of a place made for uh, contemporary. In terms of Montreal, they tend to be from Montreal. Even the ones, the artists that did come from the Eastern Township uh, moved to Montreal usually. Mm. Okay. Do you see any evidence of um, the fact of these exhibitions happening more regularly? Clearly, in Montreal, um, encouraging more local artists to come out. Uh, I would say that they, were, they made more space for yeah contemporary work. Yes, I, I think that they did contribute, and uh, certainly uh, once the once it, the second attempt was made at the end of the eighteen seventies, eighteen seventy nine, and so on, mm -hmm. and then we see a really huge difference. And in fact, in oh. the eighties and nineties. By the 90s, 
most of the artists that were showing at the uh, spring exhibition were women. And uh, because I think, and, and this is something that I want to, to look at more, but I think that there really was an effort to develop the community side of the interest of the art exhibition. And that was a way that we could bring uh, more people to see the exhibitions and so on. So it's true that the women artists were not considered as prestigious in many cases as the male artists, but they brought people that were interested in art and they, and it developed, there was a real, uh, most of the uh, students at the art school were also women. And they mm. were, you know, uh, so there, that, that's one of the things that I wanted to watch. And so this, this early period is a period of, you know, uh, rigidity if you want, but, yeah. but it forces the art association to become more responsive to the community that's, uh, that's there. The same thing with, I would say with French Canadians is that French Canadians were very reluctant to get involved Okay. But he learned to use the art exhibition uh, for the they were told that in the uh, in the newspapers, uh, you know, that Laminaire, for example, and then La Presse and so on, would would talk about the French Canadians that were showing at the art association. And okay. you know, there were there were some times there were very cordial relations and the and the between the two communities. But basically the idea was each person uses it for their own interest, or each right. community uses it for their own interest. Fascinating. So Lorraine had a question which you've just kind of answered about, um, did these exhibits get, exhibitions get coverage in the French press? And it sounds like at least the French Canadian artist participants got coverage in the French language press. That's right. And sometimes, you know, the more major art, art uh, work that were shown were also mentioned in the French press, but they certainly yeah. was used for its own, uh, for the, for sure yeah. right support your own yeah so rod mcleod has a has a question that's linked actually to what you were just talking about as well which is how do we assess the levels of attendance at montreal exhibitions were some exhibitions more successful than others and how would you know there's an historian's question yeah, yeah. uh well uh, there there is um there, there were reviews in of in the four uh, English newspapers that were existed at that time. There was the Gazette, the Witness, the mm -hmm. Herald, and the Star. Um, the Star came only at the 1869, um, and they would there would be comments there on uh, whether it was well attended or not. And um, you know, usually you'd have to take these with a grain of salt. So that you know, sometimes they would they they could probably be exaggerated um but you know i think that uh, they gave at least an indication that they were and there were some exhibitions that um that were quite successful and there were others that weren't and there was one in 18 and one of the reasons in in, in 1868 there was a wonderful exhibition in many ways uh but um there weren't very many people there and it was really because they held an, an exhibition in the previous year and it was just uh, but that was, uh, they couldn't get enough uh, new works and so on. And so this uh, it didn't attract the same attention as uh, the one that had been held in 1867. But that, that basically the only way that we can evaluate the importance is through the newspaper reports. Uh, I haven't been able to find any other. Uh, and yet sometimes later on, the statistics get a lot better as the, as the years go on. And uh, there, then we have, you know, number of ticket sales, for example, that uh, become available, but that's not available for the early years. Okay. I just want to, before I go to the next question, I just want to pause for a sec on this on this um, question of methodology and uh, being an historian and just underline that sentences in your talk, such as you talked about the attempt um, of the Montreal group to liaise with US distributors and patrons um, to bring in more paintings. And then you say, it did not appear to be a success since it was not repeated. And I just want to underscore for everyone how many probably um, dry administrative uh, documents and letters, right? modes of correspondence you would have gone through to come to that one sentence conclusion <laughs> um and and um thank you and congratulate you on on doing that kind of work um it's something uh, that i've always admired in what i've read of yours lauren 
Um, so we have okay. another question. Uh, so Lorraine asks actually about sources. Uh, where did you find relevant archives? What, and specifically about what were your sources for the Montreal um, exhibitions? Well, we're lucky in Montreal that all of the uh, catalogs uh, are available. They're available online um, through uh, one of the, uh, was probably done in some of the Google tweets that were, that were done at the very beginning. Uh, I, I forget the exact site I've got. Uh, I can easily provide that if anybody's interested. Um, and uh, for the, um, for the, I went through the minutes of the a AGM and the council meeting. And um, they're all handwritten, but I was able to get photocopies of them. And uh, and I actually typed them up as I was as I was reading them. And it really helped me comment on them and organize my thoughts on them. And it, it, it helped me search it uh, much, much more quickly and efficiently once I had a typed version of that. And I did that for about 1864 to 1872. Um, and uh, so those are the those are the main things. There's not a, there are a number of um, secondary studies in uh, Montreal that go through the administrative changes, who was and so on. Trudel, uh, Jean Trudel, who was a former director of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, uh, did, did a, a number of articles on that, on the administrative aspect. Um, and uh, and and uh, there's an excellent doctoral thesis by a fellow called um, Marc Gauthier that I think was really good as well. And other than that, there are some old, uh, in the other places, I was able to work with the Liverpool archives. I, I just wrote them and, and, and uh, they were very friendly, very forthcoming and so on. And they uh, sent me uh, copies of catalogs and, uh, and everything like that. So that was really great. And um, I what, didn't have quite as much success finding the Ontario, the Ontario documents, but now I do believe I found them, and I and I am going to consult them soon. So, uh, uh, Boston also I was able to find a, a number of catalogs online, and uh, there's also some excellent uh, theses and and uh, uh, books that were done. They're, you know, they date a little bit, but they but they give a lot of very factual information. Which was very useful. Brilliant. Um, as you're looking through the the catalogs, we have a question here about. So you've talked about the artists and sort of their demographics and the percentage of local contemporary artists in these exhibits here in Montreal specifically. The the art that was being hung was it? I imagine broadly representational. Was it? Yeah, yeah. Was it like landscapes? Was it figurative? Uh, the landscapes were uh, very popular. Interestingly enough, lots of times people say, oh, these art exhibitions, they were just that people like to see their portraits being hung up in these art exhibitions and everything like that. But there were not a lot of portraits. And uh, they, I would say that it was mainly landscapes and then what we call a uh, pencil du genre. That is, you know, kind of seen more, sometimes with a moral, uh, uh, message attached to it uh, about children being obedient or uh, the temptations of um, life in the city and things like that. There, there were a number of what we call genres of painting, but um, and not a lot of portraits. And, you know, in Montreal, there were not a lot of old masters, what they call old masters. There were some, uh, and in some cases, they were copies. In some cases, they were announced as copies that, you know, since it was very difficult to see, uh, you know, uh, European art and everything, there were people that were specializing in copying old things, old masters and so on. Um, so, um, uh, so there was that, so there was that as well. But compared to Boston, Boston, there was a, a number of paintings that were old masters. And there was a landscape school, the Hudson River School, of course, which was very active at that time, and which uh, was, you know, was really well represented then. Interestingly enough, in Liverpool, the um, the academy was more progressive, if you like. They they certainly were interested in, for example, the um, the pre-Raphaelites, -Rapha uh, 
more inter than the actual uh, population. The population was rather relatively critic, uh, critical of them, and the uh, Fine Arts Society that was developed by the uh, art patrons was explicitly to kind of get away from the pre-Raphaelite and uh, to show more popular types of paintings that was much more oriented towards the public than the uh, Liverpool Academy itself. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Um <laughs> through the different uh, sort of repertoires of paintings in the in the different exhibits. Um, Peter Roberts asks, you mentioned, Lauren, an early connection with industrial and agricultural exhibitions in North America, um, in Ontario, right? Uh, but also in Liverpool. Were these uh, happening at the same time or were they quite, were they separated? I don't uh, I don't recall uh, seeing them in Liverpool. They existed in in Lower Canada and in Montreal as well, uh, but they they never really took off, and they were much like they were never annual. Whereas in Upper Canada they were annual, and mm -hmm. um, they uh, they were really uh, I studied very closely, and this is something I spent a lot of time on, and and and, and without really including it in my research uh, results. Uh, I, I studied very much two of those provincial uh, exhibitions, and um, they were very poorly organized. Whereas, the, you know, the, interesting, the agricultural exhibition was very, very well organized with the different types of uh, cows and horses and, and everything like that. But the, the fine arts exhibition, it was just pell mell. There was, it, was, it wasn't really commented on very much by the uh, uh, the observers and so on. There were the, again the 1865 exhibition in Montreal was one that had the most decorative art in there. There was furniture, there was uh, appliances and things like that that were uh, to kind of show the uh, interest of industrial design. But that too was uh, was uh, uh, decided not to pursue that. The same thing with photographs. They at the beginning there were photographs. In the exhibitions, and then they were decided to not to include them. Hmm. Which is something for Montreal with Notman and the you know the really aesthetic uh, reflections that he was having about photography, and he was a very active member of the uh, art association for a number of years, and then gradually gradually said, "Well, I don't I don't need this. I don't need this art association." Right. That's, so this question about um, industrial and agricultural exhibitions also, I mean, in your answer to that question, what I'm hearing too is that people were already going to the agricultural and industrial exhibition. And so that was a place where art could kind of show up and expect an audience. I mean, it, it right, right, what you're saying about how there were, but did you say a much larger number of women artists in the 1890s in the Montreal exhibitions, in part because people would come to see exactly. that part, right? So it's, it, either you're, you're, you're looking for new work or you're in a place where people already are or fascinating, right? In terms of where this shows up then. Um, one, one thing I would say, there were uh, state fairs in the United States, in New York in particular, but again, there was a complete divorce between the art that was in the art, fine art sections of these uh, uh, right. state exhibitions, but it never uh, overlapped as it did in Ontario with the fine art in organizing institution. And uh, so really Ontario, it really is an interesting example for them. Yeah. One maybe, I'm not sure how we are for time, but one maybe, Final question we have um, from a participant um, asking, did people have to pay entrance fees to get into these exhibits? And if so, could working class people, for example, afford? Uh, interesting question. If you were a member of the, uh, in Montreal, we're talking about here, uh, if you were a member of the Art Association, it was $5 a year, and which was you know, a significant amount in those days. And uh, uh, then it was free. To get in, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, otherwise, the um, it would cost I think twenty five cents. And later on, there were periods where uh, there would be a, a, an evening that would be free. Uh, oh. And but um, so there, and that question was raised a lot. Uh, 
but uh, whether whether but the proceeds from from these uh, uh, that's one way also that that uh, I'm thinking of Rod a uh, question about evaluating the uh, attendance is to look at the um, is to look at the amount of money that was in the budget uh, for revenues from ticket sales and so on. And there's something I could try and do uh, with more detail. So it's an interesting question. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Are there any lingering oh, questions? Oh, yes, one more. Duncan Sanderson says, I appreciated the comparison between the cities. Um, I think it'd be interesting to include more comparison of the Francophone side and especially perhaps more significant participation by women at the time. Yeah, that uh, you're, you know, that's right. And, you know, it's just that there's a lot in there and uh, it wouldn't fit into a 25 minute presentation. So I, I tried to focus on this question that I feel is really important of the having a renewable source of painting that I think that hasn't really been thought about as much. But to get, but I think, and I tried to do this a little bit in, in a talk that I gave in another situation, this idea of what were these exhibitions really looking like? Uh, I think that is a legitimate concern and, and uh, I, you know, it could easily be done at another time. Yeah. Did I understand correctly, Lauren, from an earlier response um, that Francophone artists didn't have their own association at this time, so in the 1860s, for example, and so if they were to exhibit in this kind of format, it would be with the art association. Yes, in fact, you know, there, there, there really wasn't uh, an art, a, a large art association on the French side. It never really developed. Uh, what did develop were there were some artistic societies that developed and mm. uh, uh, and so on, but. Um, the art world, just in general, in French Quebec, it's a very interesting question, was not oriented around landscape and uh, paintings and so on. It was much more oriented, of course, around the work in the churches was a mm -hmm. major source, and portraits were a major source. Uh, but um, the development, uh, people like Suzanne Coutet or Ozias Lezuc and so on that are coming towards the end of the 20th and uh, 19th century, uh, they either show in small venues uh, or they show at the uh, art association, uh, but there's no there's no kind of general. But, you know, I mean, it certainly would be an interesting thing to, to talk a bit more. Right. right. Good, well, another question of where the people are too, right? But who... Yeah, but you know, I mean, there were a lot of, there were a lot of uh, uh, French Canadians in Montreal and, and a lot that were middle class or even upper class. Uh, and but the, the the visual arts were never nearly as important as music, for example, or or uh, even theater. I would say. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks so much, Lauren. I learned a great deal, and I'm sure that our uh, participants did as well. It's a pleasure to hear you. Let's yes, indeed, give Lauren Thank a round you. of applause. Thank you very much. It's a work in progress, and I really appreciate uh, uh, the comments and questions and. Uh, uh, I, I, it was really good to be able to work on this for this uh, presentation. Thank you uh, so much. First of all, thank you to Lauren um, for this work, and as as Aaron pointed out, your ongoing work, it's helping us collectively understand not just individual artists or writers, but also the context, the cultural scenes of uh, particularly of Montreal, but of English speaking Quebec, it's really enriching. Thanks to everyone for attending today's event. We'd like to hear your feedback and we invite you to fill out the evaluation form for today's lunch and learn. And there will be, oh, there's already a link in the chat. And I believe Anna Hunt will also send it to you afterwards. So we'll, we'll we, we very much appreciate your feedback because this is an ongoing series. Stay tuned for our upcoming events in our Lunch and Learn series. We have one taking place in two weeks on something completely different. And we do pride ourselves on a little bit of variety. So this one is on the role of language in pregnancy outcomes in Quebec. The link to that is in the chat. A description and a registration link will be at, through that link. 
The best way to learn about what's coming up in QuestGrin's programming is to sign up for our newsletter if you haven't already, or to follow us on Facebook or LinkedIn. So there's a bunch of new links in the chat. And in closing, we again recognize the financial support of the Department of Canadian Heritage, the Secretariat aux Relations avec les Québécois d'Expression Anglaise, Canadian Institute for Research on Linguistic Minorities, and Concordia University. So thank you, Erin, for handling questions coming fast and furious, and to our very esteemed speaker, Dr. Lauren Houston. Erin uh, and Lauren are both um, Questgrin researcher members, and we appreciate very much their ongoing research and involvement in Questgrin. Thank you. Have a good day.